everybody. Welcome to the American Banjo Museum and another one of our virtual tours. This is Johnny Beyer, the Executive Director of the Museum, and I'm delighted to be with you again to share some of our treasures. You know, this thing has been going on an awful long time, and we would like to see it come to an end. But until it does, we're going to try and give you your banjo fix every day with something different that we hope you will enjoy. Today is going to be, we talk about different, absolutely different. What we're going to do is take you on a little tour of some banjo oddities or hybrid instruments. A lot of people are, may have heard, some of the heard of some of the instruments that you're going to see today, but if you haven't, I hope you'll find this entertaining and enlightening. Uh, during the 1920s in particular, but let's put it this way, after the turn of the last century, as the banjo was reinventing itself, kind of becoming the voice of uh, the early jazz music or the rhythmic pulse of early jazz music, there were a lot of experiments going on in banjo development. Yes, if you're a banjo player, you're aware of the two major four string styles of banjos, the tenor banjo and the plectrum banjo. Those were the instruments that really, really drove the banjo home during its mainstream popularity during the jazz age. But banjo manufacturers saw a lot of potential in other areas where they thought, well, we can sell some banjos if we create new instruments, or they would try and experiment and create something that didn't exist before, a market that didn't exist before, by creating instruments for something that wasn't even invented yet. So we're gonna go through a few of these things and tell you why they were important. One of the things a lot of people uh, don't realize is prior to the jazz age, in the world of fretted instruments, these frets along the fingerboard, or these bars on the fingerboards are called frets, if you're not aware. Uh, in the world of fretted instruments, in the early 1900s, and late 1800s, early 1900s, it wasn't the banjo, but the mandolin, which was the most popular fretted instrument. There were mandolin orchestras and soloists, and it, was, it just seemed to be everywhere. So what you had in the early part of the 20th century was a lot of mandolin players. Now, enter the jazz age and the popularity of the four-string banjo, and you had mandolin players, one, not only having a lot of skill on a fretted instrument that has strings and is played with a pick, but you also had mandolin players who were finding themselves not as much in demand because of the popularity of the banjo. So what a lot of banjo manufacturers did to, uh, how should we say, cash in on that situation was started to make banjo mandolins. They would take a banjo body, which is pretty much established, and then they would add a neck that was the same length as a mandolin neck, and it was strung with eight strings. This one, of course, has a busted string, so it's a seven string, but there should be another string on there. And so that what they would do is create an instrument that felt very, very comfortable for a mandolin player to pick up and immediately play and still get something resembling a banjo sound. So that's where banjo mandolins came from. We have a number of them in our collection. This is one of the most beautiful. This was made by the Gibson Company somewhere around, let's call it 1918 or 1920. And it is in very, uh, virtually pristine condition. That's what's so wonderful about it. The metal is perfect and the wood finish is perfect and it reflects Gibson's attention to the beauty of the wood that they lavished upon their mandolins at the time and the beauty of the finish that they put on it. This beautiful color and sunburst is, is it's, it's quite breathtaking. I hope the camera can pick up just how delightful that uh, finish is on this, on this particular banjo. But uh, banjo mandolins uh, were made by many manufacturers. The fact of the matter is, now that we've told you all the good stuff, is that the physics of a mandolin don't really work too well on the banjo. The mandolin has eight strings, and those strings are tuned up really, really tightly, which creates a lot of downward pressure on this bridge. And what most banjo mandolin players found is that if you were to get the strings low enough where you could actually press them down, they started to buzz and rattle. 
And if you adjusted the action or the, you know, the playing action of the banjo mandolin to get the strings where they wouldn't buzz and rattle, they were too hard to press down. So the physics of uh, mandolins didn't translate too well to the banjo. And even though you see quite a number of banjo mandolins made by quite a number of banjo, man banjo manufacturers, the, uh, like I said, the, the uh, actual utility value of banjo mandolins still remains questionable. But in terms of a reflection of what was going on at that time and some of the beauty of the art of making instruments, this is a really a good example. Another kind of uh, hybrid banjo was the banjo ukulele. If you're not familiar, back in the 1920s, the ukulele was kind of the nation's musical pal, as people called it. It was easy to carry around, it was easy to play, it was acoustic, and if you picked up a ukulele, more than likely you'd be able to play a song that people could recognize within just a few minutes. So there were so many ukulele players out there. When the banjo became popular during the Jazz Age, virtually all of the banjo manufacturers started to make banjo ukuleles. Additionally, lesser grade manufacturers also made very, very cheap banjo ukuleles, so they were available to just about everyone. But when you start to take the major banjo manufacturers, people like Bacon and Vega and Gibson and Ludwig and, and other companies that took the time to make professional grade banjo ukuleles, and you find those instruments today, you've really found something special. This is a Bacon banjo ukulele, uh, and, and again, we'll have to put it somewhere 1924, 25, maybe 26. It's, it's hard to say, but it's a, a, a full resonator ukulele. Uh, it has a sil Bacon silver bell tone ring in it, an Ottinger style tailpiece, uh, geared planet pegs. I mean, everything that Bacon would have lavished onto their a high-grade silver bell professional banjos was put into this banjo ukulele. I will point out this has been completely refinished. This is not the original wood finish nor the metal finish. More than likely this was originally nickel plated and it would have had a darker wood finish on it somewhere along the line because of, for whatever reason, it was uh, refinished, wood was refinished and it was gold plated. But it does make for quite a striking, uh, striking visual instrument. But in terms of a musical tool, there aren't too many better sounding banjo ukuleles than this one by Bacon right here. It's a real, real wonderful musical instrument. Uh, when we talked about the mandolin players making this transition to being banjo players, and the physics of the mandolin not working too well with the banjo, there was one company that decided that uh, they could address that question really quickly because it became quite obvious that the, uh, uh, you, the <laughs> I should say, mandolin uh, physics didn't work too well with a banjo. So the Paramount Company uh, started making what they called melody banjos. And most people have never seen a melody banjo. A melody banjo is, this is a full-size Paramount style A banjo body but attached to it is a neck, very similar, uh, actually identical in scale, to a mandolin neck. So it's very short scale, which allows a mandolin player to Im immediately pick up and play the melody banjo. Also, in, in groups where they were reading music, this is tuned just like a mandolin, so there was no need for uh, re relearning tuning or transposing. The big thing about melody banjos that differentiate them from the mandolin banjos is that these only have four strings. So even though the four strings are tuned to the same pitch as the mandolin, because they are not doubled, there isn't an inordinate amount of downward pressure on the bridge, and the physics work beautifully for someone who knows mandolin tuning and wants to play the banjo, and keep that uh, same fingering uh, distance on the fingerboard. That's the beauty of the melody banjo. The reality is uh, most people just basically went to the regular tenor banjo. If they wanted to play the four string banjo, they found that the tenor banjo was more versatile and had a, a kind of a wider musical range than the, the melody banjo. But in banjo orchestras, particularly Harry Reeser's Eskimos, which were a huge uh, celebrity band back in the 1920s, you will see the uh, Paramount Melody Banjo being a featured and essential part of their musical uh, uh, ensemble. Then we have uh, 
a different hybrid banjo that I want to get into here. We should point out, prior to the Jazz Age, the banjo, when we call the classic era of banjos, classic era banjos were five string instruments. They were played with bare fingers, strings were made of animal intestine, and in a general sense, uh, you were playing classical music or European-inspired dance music, and uh, it was a wonderful time. The classic era was a high point in musicality for the, uh, uh, the banjo. But as uh, you know, American popular music evolved to an, you know, incorporate ragtime and early jazz, and early dance bands started to incorporate brass and reed instruments, those classic era banjos were not really a good fit anymore. So you had a lot of banjo players who played the classic era banjo, bare fingers, gut strings, open back instruments, and you found those players gravitating towards becoming jazz banjo players. And the differentiation for the most part being they were playing with a pick. They were playing, they called it a plectrum, but they were, that's a proper name for a pick. So what they would do is if you were one of the classic era players who now started playing with a pick or plectrum, you were categorized as a plectrum banjo player. And the plectrum banjos, the four string plectrum banjos we know today, evolved in that manner. They are basically what the earlier classical five string guys took and adapted to playing jazz. Rather than plucking out individual notes, they started strumming chords and ultimately took off that extra fifth string that was a droning string and kind of getting in the way of playing full chords. All this said, there were certain players who wanted to play the plectrum style of banjo using a pick and strumming chords and the uh, individual notes and such, but they were really quite advanced. And one of the guys was a guy named Brent Hayes. He had a professional uh, name as Scargold. His uh, uniform, this of course is a black and white photograph, but his uniform represent, or was taken from a Canadian Royal Mounted Police uniform, and his name, Scargold, was a contraction of scarlet and gold, which were the colors of the Mountie uniforms. So when he appeared on stage, he appeared in scarlet and gold and called himself Scargold. Well, in addition to being an obviously innately gifted entertainer and somebody who really wanted to connect with an, an audience, he was an amazing banjo player. He played the plectral style of banjo, strumming in different uh, strumming patterns, not just all four strings at one time, but any variety of patterns. But he didn't do it on a four string banjo. He did it on a five string banjo. This is Scargold's first banjo that was made for him by the Vega Company. And I, I want you to, I want to point out to all of you that uh, at first glance, it looks like a, a, a Vega phone banjo from that time period. Uh, but it's really, really special. It's got a bigger head, uh, and a lot of some of the ba uh, Vega banjos from that time period had the larger 12-inch uh, or 11 and 15 16, 15 16 head. But the big thing about this, and it, there was no hint given because there are no strings on the banjo right now, we have to find the tailpiece, but the big thing about this banjo is that it is a five-string plectrum banjo. This was made for Brent Hayes using five full-length strings with an additional peg, a tuning peg sticking through the center of the peg head here. So Brent Hayes would tune this banjo like a, a, a typical plectrum banjo on the top, but he also had a lower bass string that allowed him to take this down, and uh, I, I believe his bottom string was F, uh, where he would take it. So he had a much broader uh, musical range on the banjo, and was able, because of his amazing musicianship and technique, to play classic music like it's never been heard played on a banjo before. And I'm uh, hoping that we can share with you some of the rare recordings of Brent Hayes playing this banjo because it's an amazing display of musicianship and virtuosity that most of us have never, never, ever heard before. So uh, this is, again, one of these hybrid banjos that uh, most people have never seen. I, I don't know that uh, you'll ever see another one particular with, particularly with the pedigree associated with a guy named Brent Hayes.
Okay, uh, we talked about banjo manufacturers trying to make something for other, man other types of musicians. Uh, as the banjo became popular, we have to remember the guitar, even though it really hadn't hit mainstream popularity, it was still a very popular instrument in America and was catching on more and more as the jazz age went on. So what you had were quite a number of guitar players who wanted to play the banjo. Uh, Johnny St. Cyr is, is a perfect example. If you find early, example, or early photographs of uh, Louis Armstrong and the, and the Hot Fives and, and such, uh, you're, you're gonna see pictures of Johnny St. Cyr with an early Vigaphone banjo. His was a six string guitar banjo. Uh, what we have here is a really, really interesting guitar banjo, basically a banjo body with a guitar neck. It has six strings tuned just like a guitar. So the idea or the concept was if you were a guitar player and you wanted to play the banjo, you could easily do so by getting yourself a guitar banjo. This particular one is a wonderful historical example as well. This is a later uh, Gibson banjo that was made back in the, the early 1960s by the Gibson Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. This was made for Homer Haynes. Homer was half of Homer and Jethro. If you have any age at all, you would remember Homer and Jethro as being wonderful common comedians and comics, but they were also absolutely great musicians. And when uh, Homer and Jethro started to do Kellogg's Corn Flakes commercials for the Beverly Hillbillies television show back in the early 60s, they became mainstream stars and Gibson wanted to take any opportunity, opportunity they could to promote their instruments via Homer and Jethro being uh, associated with the Beverly Hillbillies. So they made this six string banjo uh, to uh, allow Homer Haynes, who played a Gibson L5 guitar, to feel real comfortable because in fact, this is a Gibson uh, PB250 body with a Gibson L5 guitar neck attached to it. Truly a one-of-a-kind custom instrument. And it's still set up exactly the way Homer Haynes left it. It's a really, really wonderful piece of history that uh, you'll never see anywhere else because this is the only one that exists. I want to thank Trent Haynes for loaning this to the museum so we can share this treasure with you all. It's, a, it's really a wonderful, again, hybrid banjo. Now, here's the key. Uh, as the jazz age wound down, and the guitar became more and more popular with dance bands, banjo players and banjo manufacturers were some of the hardest to let go of what had been so good to them for so long. So somehow, banjo players wanted to find their way into the guitar section of uh, orchestras. And most of the banjo manufacturers offered them instruments to uh, make that transition. If you go out in our gallery, you're going to see a Paramount tenor harp. It's a round, wooden-bodied instrument that is shaped like a banjo. It has a banjo neck on it. It's strung like a banjo. It's tuned like a banjo. But if you play it, because it's wooden, it sounds a lot like a guitar. Then what happened was, and by the way, Paramount's not the only one. There are a number of companies that made guitar-like uh, instruments that allowed banjo players to get into the guitar craze that followed the banjo craze of the jazz age. One of the real hybrid things to come out of the whole mix was the Gibson Company's 1936 introduction of the first electric instrument that came in their product line. It was called an electric banjo. And this is one of the very, very few rare examples of an early Gibson electric banjo. Uh, and, and I point this out, even though today most people know the name Gibson and its association with electric banjos, or electric guitars, basically like the Les Paul guitar that everyone venerates, uh, Gibson's first foray into electric instruments was in a banjo. Their, their Charlie Christian guitar that came out shortly afterwards had the same uh, electronic magnet, ma magnetic pickup as this instrument had, but this predates the Charlie uh, Christian guitar by uh, at least several months, uh, according to all the Gibson historians. It's interesting to note because the banjo was so popular that Gibson, when they wanted to get into electric instruments, made their first electric instrument in the form of a banjo. This 
is a plectrum electric banjo of which there are 19 known to exist. And this one is in beautiful condition and really reflective of, again, Gibson's attention to detail in the uh, finishing, selections of woods, and uh, in this case, the beautiful Art Deco uh, design on the uh, inlays of the fingerboard and the peghead. Really, really a, a very, very tasteful looking instrument. Uh, all that said, in terms of, uh, again, how should I say, workability or feasibility, oh, not all that much. If you plug it in, yeah, it sounds a little bit like an electric guitar, but to be honest with you, it sounds a lot more like an electric banjo. And some of the tuning of the banjos, uh, a plectrum electric banjo sounds a little bit better, but if you get an electric tenor banjo, uh, and Gibson made some with, with the tenor neck as well, they sound like an amplified tenor banjo, not necessarily that warm guitar uh, tone that you, you were looking for and band leaders were looking for. So for the most part, these four string uh, experiments in getting banjo players into the guitar chair of orchestras didn't work out all that great. But they are certainly a novelty or a rarity. And again, a reflection of what these companies would do to fulfill what they thought would be a demand or what they might create as being a demand. Now we'll go to a couple more instruments over here. I want to talk about a hybrid. Here's a real hybrid. This is a cello banjo. There were uh, some legitimate uh, needs for banjos that mirrored all voices of orchestras. And banjo manufacturers realized that. Some of them were a carryover from the classic era, but there were also banjo orchestras uh, playing beautifully written uh, orchestrations that called for lower voices and higher voices like the melody banjo. This is on the other end of the spectrum. This is tuned exactly like a cello. It's basically tenor banjo tuning, C, G, D, A, but it is tuned down an octave. This particular one was made by the Bacon Company as in, and is made very much in the manner of a Bacon silver bell banjo. It has the F-hole flange. It's got a big head. This is a 14-inch head that is quite a... Uh, quite loose at the time. This is a, a, a uh, how should we say, a calfskin head on here. And uh, I, you know, the back of the banjo looks pretty much like a, a Bacon and Dane number one silver bell. Uh, this, uh, this said, if you were holding it, you'd realize you were holding something much, much, much more substantial in weight and, and, and size than a regular tenor banjo. But it's finished off and manufactured very, very similar to a B&D Silver Bell number no. one. Uh, you don't see them too often. Uh, so when this one came uh, on the market, we really grabbed it because we wanted to make sure we had a, a, a representation of a cello banjo. And then comes down to, uh, some of you may have seen this before in the museum, a truly one-of-a-kind instrument. Uh, when you take the cello banjo, and take it a little step further lower into the musical spectrum, you end up with the bass. Uh, because there were banjo bands out during the 1920s, uh, it seemed logical that creating a bass banjo would be a good idea. So you could have your uh, melody banjos and your tenor banjos and your plectrum banjos and your cello banjos. Well, we might as well have a bass banjo. So one of the major manufacturers, Gibson, decided we're going to set up and tool up and do a bass banjo. They think, oh, this is going to be great. Uh, everyone's going to buy them. So what they did is set up this huge 22-inch head with all this gunmetal hardware that was made and set up. Uh, it had to be you know, custom made for this particular banjo, as well as a Florent, not a Florentine, but a, a white uh, holly type finish on this uh, resonator, this huge resonator, as well as the neck. And then on the top, they put this uh, pyrolin peghead overlay that's inlaid with rhinestones, very similar to the uh, Gibson Florentine model banjo. So they did all this work, created this huge instrument, and uh, sent it out to uh, Gene Goldcat, I, I believe was the band that got it, and uh, realized it didn't work. Just like the uh, mandolin banjo, the physics of how the strings press down on the bridge and, and such 
on a bass, they just don't relate too well to the banjo. So while it is a huge, beautiful, full visual, uh, you know, dynamic uh, thing to look at, it really, really doesn't sound great as a bass instrument. All that said, once everybody realized that this was, this was kind of the Edsel of the, uh, uh, Edsel, boy, there's a reference that you have to go back. Once they realized this was kind of a failed experiment, it turns out that this is the only Gibson bass banjo that was actually manufactured and shipped, according to Gibson Ledgers. So we, we, we talk about this cello banjo being rare. Uh, we, talk about, uh, we talk about this banjo bass, and we realize truly rare, one of a kind, the only one that exists. So these are banjo hybrids from the lowest end of the musical spectrum all the way up to the highest end of the orchestral spectrum, banjos were made to fit the bill when there was a demand seen to be uh, filled. So, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour. I hope you've seen something you haven't seen before because these are some of the oddities and oddity treasures of the American Banjo Museum. For right now, we're gonna thank you for tuning in and I hope this filled your banjo fix for the day. If you haven't done so, uh, become a member of the American Banjo Museum. When all this uh, virus stuff is done and you guys are out playing your banjos, if you're a member of the museum, you'll see what we're up to before we do it, and we'd love to have you as part of our family. Send in a donation. We really could appreciate it at this time and would really love to have you supporting what we're trying to keep happening here in Oklahoma City. For right now, I want to thank you for tuning in. Tune in tomorrow. I don't know what we're going to be doing, but I promise you it will be different, and I can kind of promise it will be interesting. For right now, I'm Johnny Byer. Thanks again. See you tomorrow.